Good morning. My name is Erica James, Dean of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome to another engaging session of Beyond Business. As an expansion of the Tarnapol Lecture Series, Beyond Business is an ongoing conversation that explores the most complex and pressing issues impacting individuals and organizations around the world. This year's three-part series shines a light on how analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning are providing viable pathways for solutions in every domain. Earlier this fall, we talked about how analytics influences critical decision-making in the field of finance. In December, we looked at how data and analytics can offer surprising ways to increase accountability and drive social good. And today, we'll talk about how data comes into play both on and off the field in professional sports. I'm really excited to be joined today by two influential voices in their industries. Eric Bradlow is a Wharton Marketing Professor and Vice Dean of Analytics at Wharton. Amy Howe is CEO of Fantasy Sports and sports betting website, FanDuel. So before we get started, I just want to let you know that today's conversation will be followed by an audience Q&A. So please use the comments section to submit your questions. We'll be monitoring them and getting to your questions towards the end of the program. All right, I'm excited to dive in. Amy and Eric, welcome. We're glad to have you. So for these first couple of questions, I, I'm really interested in hearing both of your perspectives. So I'd like you first to engage both of you. Uh, as we're seeing in most industries and sectors, the use of data and analytic methods is becoming more and more prevalent in sports. What are some of the recent ways you have seen this trend influence the sports world, including changes implemented in response to COVID? Eric, why don't we start with you? So I think, you know, in the world of analytics and sports, I think we're blessed by the movie Moneyball. We're blessed by the book Moneyball. And everyone thinks of the Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill movie, where in some sense they're evaluating players on using data science. But I think on the other hand, we're cursed by it because it makes people think, I think, too narrowly about how data analytics is used. For example, now analytics is used not just for on-field stuff, like how many of us are screaming at the screen, go for it on fourth and two, go for it on fourth and two. That's almost become <laughs> part, right? Amy and I are both raising our hands on this one. But it's also influencing things like training. So for example, imagine athletes, women and men, being censored up while they're training. Imagine women and men being tracked while they're sleeping and noticing what sleeping patterns are related to better performance. Imagine people that are actually tracked and their motion tracked in ways that we can do injury prevention using analytics. Imagine, about, imagine general managers doing player worth and evaluation. So to me, um, in some sense, analytics has moved from a, let's use it just for player valuation. Let's also use it for on-field calls to something that's much more broad and really affects every aspect of sports. Amy, from your perspective, how would you address that question? Uh, well, first of all, Erica, thank you so much for having me um, as we were talking before. I'm a Wharton 99 MBA alum, and it was two of the best years of my life. You're all very lucky to be there, so take advantage of every moment you have. Uh, listen, how much time do you have on this particular question? Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it uh, briefly from uh, a sports betting perspective, but I also ran Ticketmaster before I came over to, uh, to run FanDuel, and I think there's some interesting examples in the ticketing world too. So at the end of the day, our entire business and our entire sports betting platform depends on real-time data, sophisticated analytics and modeling, right? If you think about, um, I have a, just to, to contextualize this, I have a globally, we have a risk and trading organization that has a thousand data scientists, statisticians, engineers every day who are setting the lines. They're building highly sophisticated models to determine what the odds are they're innovating new betting markets. So all the player props that you see, same game parlays, all of that takes highly sophisticated data that they're taking in and using you know, data feeds from other third-party providers as well. Uh, but that's our, our business wouldn't run without data and analytics. Um, we have the benefit. We're, we're run by a global entity. And as, as many of you know, sports betting 
is a relatively new industry in the U.S. It's, it's really only been legalized online for four years. But if you look at markets like U.K. and Ireland and Australia, they have decades of experience, right? So those models have been finely tuned for, for many years. But we also use it for, you know, our CRM strategy, right? When you have millions of customers, not all customers are created equal, um, and we use it for things like identifying risky behavior. One of the things that you know I'm happy to talk about in more detail, as we build this industry from the ground up in the early days, we need to make sure that we're building it responsibly so we can look at risk factors, right, and understand do we see problematic behavior that we need to flag and, and do something about. Um, so it, the, at the end of the day, our business would not run without sophisticated data and analytics. Uh, on the ticketing side, because I think there's some interesting analogies there as well, Many of you are not old enough to know, uh, to remember perhaps when you had to use paper tickets to get into a venue or a concert. <laughs> now, nowadays, you're, you're getting in with your, your phone, um, and most venues at this point are 100% digital. But I, I think that's a great example of the use of you know, data and technology to identify customers. We used to talk about it as de-anonymizing every individual that goes into a venue. So think about knowing virtually nobody, right? Because the secondary market, that ticket may have changed hands multiple times or you were entering with a paper ticket or a PDF. Now, when you enter with your phone, we can identify not, you're not yet one for one, but you can identify a large percentage of that organization. So your ability to uh, personalize the experience, your ability to deal with crisis to the, in the event that there's a security breach or manage operations within a venue goes up exponentially as a result of changing technology and data and analytics. So I'm already fascinated by this conversation, and I want to ask a question that's to, to pick up on something both of you have alluded to, and that is, in your world, is there a difference in how analytics can be used or the value of analytics depending on the sport. So for example, uh, baseball, we know to your point earlier, Eric is, uses analytics to probably the, an extreme amount. Um, how does that compare, for example, to football or to golf or to tennis or to uh, soccer? Uh, how should we think about analytics across the various sports? Well, thanks to you and our former deans, um, I've had the greatest joy for the last eight and a half years. Um, people have always joked that I have a voice for sports casting, so I haven't gotten to that goal yet, but <laughs> I have gotten to the goal for the last eight and a half years, uh, along with my colleagues, Cade Massey, Adi Weiner, and Shane Jensen, we've been doing a show on Sirius XM radio called Wharton Moneyball. And so what do we do on the show? Besides, we talk about sports and from an analytics perspective. Um, we also interview people from all kinds of different sports to understand what's going on in those sports. So originally, we we're mostly around baseball, but we even had, Erica, someone from Ultimate Frisbee, because there are now professional Ultimate Frisbee leagues. There's analytics around Ultimate Frisbee. There's certainly around soccer. You know, we just had the World Cup. We had a three-part right. special on that. So, you know, one of the comments is always, well, Lionel Messi's not that great, except when you look at how much space he creates for other players. We have people, the U.S., the Australian Open tennis is going on right now. We've had everyone from Paul Anacone to people that are training people in tennis analytics, what are patterns of players. So I would say the following. Um, it's about the data. The richer the data, the better the analytics will be. And it builds a lot on what Amy said. If you think about just, Amy, your comments about, you know, mm -hmm. just what you know from tickets and what you know from people scanning their phones and also betting patterns on FanDuel's site. So data has gotten much better. Some sports are still in the nascent stages of getting data. There isn't the same data there is in soccer today and in, you know, I don't know, tennis there is, tennis, than the way there is in basketball, football, NFL, et cetera. Yeah, it's a great question. By the way, as an aside, Eric, we just launched FanDuel TV. So if you ever want to make a guest appearance, we'd be delighted to have you. <laughs> no, we don't know what Pandora's <laughs> box you're opening there. You'd be perfect. <laughs> Um, so it's a, I, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I'll approach it from the, I think the first, the business angle, not all sports obviously are created equal if you think about sports betting. So for me, NFL, not surprisingly is by far the biggest acquisition sport, right? So somewhere between 40 and 45% of my new actives that come onto the platform 
come at some point during that NFL season. So getting, making sure I have the most competitive markets, the widest assortment, um, real-time data feeds. We work with a number of third parties and the leagues will decide oftentimes which third party they want to work with, but I've got to get acquisition right for it to win NFL. Um, NBA, while they don't drive as many new actives to the platform, just because of the sheer volume and the number of games is one of my biggest handle sports, right? Um, and so again, having a competitive assortment, those narratives also, right? If you think about the narrative and how sports betting is changing the the live broadcast, when you have Charles Barkley, who will take a position on or a point of view on a parlay or a same game parlay, and he's talking about that during the broadcast on TNT. It's just, it's a, it's a huge part of now the, the experience. Um, but it does vary by sport, right? And then I, you've got other sports, which may not be as big from an acquisition or an engagement perspective, but they're still an important part of the portfolio, right? The the golfs and the tennises and the, you know, the, the we, there's a little bit of a long tail of sports. And believe it or not, things like pickleball are even becoming. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's a, it's, you know, it's a great question. So the role of data does vary a little bit by, by sport. And the, for the big, big volume and acquisition drivers, you got to get it right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, Amy, I want to start with you on this next question. With the rise in data usage worldwide, every business must be particularly cautious with how it collects its data. And in particular, with respect to data integrity, how does FanDuel manage uh, data collection and the safety and privacy of data? Listen, it, it is a topic right now that um, it, it's one of the things that keeps me up at night every day, but it's also something that our entire organization and leadership team is, is vigilant about. If you think about sports betting, right, we're a highly regulated industry, um, but at the end of the day, what matters most to consumers is that they have a sports betting platform that they trust and your ability to make sure that you can protect that data to protect them from, from bad actors and cybersecurity threats is, is ultimately critical. You know, you start with, um, you know, you're, you're, you happen to be sitting in a state where sports betting is legalized. And if you have a FanDuel account, you had to go through a very rigorous, what we call know your customer KYC process, right? Which is much more rigorous than if you're signing up for an Amazon account or an Uber account, right? There's name, social security, email address, um, phone number, et cetera, that you have to provide in order to verify that you are who you say you are, right? Bank account information. And so it starts with, that process and you know a part of why we're trying to push so hard to legalize is if you're going with a you know there are plenty of illegal operators out there where you don't have to provide any of that information you could be under the age of 21 and betting illegally on that platform so it starts with those protections um, but we also, you know, the part of, you know, one of the advantages that Fandle has is we're sitting within this global entity called Flutter Entertainment. And we have the, a history of decades of, you know, making sure we've got the right, you know, repositories for our data, that we're protecting the data the right way, but that we're leveraging that data to provide accurate and timely data to our consumers. Because part of offering a safe and uh, good experiences to making sure that you, you know, as a consumer, you, you need to make sure you have fair odds as well. So there's so many different angles to this question, but I will say just in general, making sure that we protect our consumers from bad actors is one of the most important things we do. Yeah. Eric, I'd love for you to chime in. Is there an academic perspective that, that you have or uh, ways in which schools like Wharton can contribute to the data integrity of uh, sports? Yeah, yeah, I think from a academic perspective, which is I think is a good one, there's two perspectives. One would be kind of, you know, we talk about in some sense perturbing data. So one form of security from an algorithmic perspective as a statistician computer scientist would be imagine a company like FanDuel or others didn't keep exactly the raw data but kept some perturbed version of the raw data. So one way in which many companies think about security is don't keep all the raw data, keep some of it in some perturbed way that still allows you to answer your business problem, but actually provides more security. So this is one of the biggest issues in computer science today, at what level of aggregation and also what level of granularity and, if you like, uh, you know, accurately, accurateness to keep the data. The second, which is I was thinking about, was who owns the data? 
So that's a big issue that's going to be facing all of us, not just at FanDuel, but us as academics, which is, you know, let's imagine I opened with my comments about imagine having a player with sensor data. Well, does the team own the data? Like if I'm training with sensors on and they want to lower my salary or cut me or do something because they've gotten data from my physical body measured by sensors. So I think we're going to have an era where public policy is going to have a lot to say about who owns the data, who gives up rights to use their data for our analytics engines. And it's part of it's going to part of a large data privacy discussion that I think is going to happen going forward. So though big data, artificial intelligence, and other emerging analytics tools can help solve problems to advance business, we know data alone is not is insufficient. What does the sports world need to do to ensure that it has designed data practices without bias or incomplete information? Yes, Eric, it, I'm happy to, if, okay, I'm happy yeah, to jump into on this one from, yeah, but it, it's a, it's a very interesting question from a sports betting perspective, because as you can imagine, while on the one hand, there's a massive amount of data and advanced analytics and science that goes into setting the lines and determining the odds, there's also quite a bit of judgment, right, that you have to factor in and soft signals that our risk and trading organization is taking in. And then there's always an element of, you know, things may change at the last minute. And so that obviously can impact the outcome of the game. But for us, I think it starts with making sure that the data that we are using is high integrity data, right? And that comes from a few different sources. First of all, we have a very long history, decades, right, because we're owned by a global entity of making sure that we're using the, the best data signals and the most accurate data signals to feed the model. But we're also um, partnering with official, like in the case of the NFL and the NBA, they will partner with official data providers, right? Sports Radar and Bet Genius, whose entire job is to make sure that they are providing high integrity, real-time data that again is feeding the models. So there's a lot of different signals that you're taking in, hard data and science, but at the same time, part of the job of a trader in a sports betting company is also to overlay judgment on top of that. Um, but even once you do all of that, right, things may change at the last minute. COVID is a great example, Erica. You asked about the impact of COVID earlier on. And during COVID, you know, COVID, a, a lot of times players were getting sick and having to sit out at the last minute. And so this was less of a, you know, how do we set the lines and more of a, how do we make sure that we're being fair to consumers? We started to offer a product called Bad Bet Relief. And if something bad happened at the last minute that, you know, you couldn't control and you had already placed a bet, we'd either refund your bet or we'd find a way to, you know, to make you whole. So there's a, as much science as there is in this industry, there's also there's, there's a lot of art and judgment that factors into it as well. So Thanks. just just Aaron. building on Amy Amy's response. First of all, I had not heard of this bad bet relief. I think it's a yeah. great idea. No, no, <laughs> it was it, it's it's great for not just it's fair, but it's also um, it's a great way to market yourself. So I think that's a great idea. I'm going to have to read up on that. Um, I, I would say two things, Erica. One is you know one of my favorite. One of my most cited videos that's watched on YouTube, I, I, I don't know why, but like 10 years ago, I videoed something and I recorded something said, the data you wish you had is never coming. And so the perfect data set, the perfect clean data set, all the variables you'd like to measure, that's never coming. As a matter of fact, what I think we teach at the Wharton School is empirically driven decision making with incomplete information. That's what we do. Every situation, every business decision has incomplete information. However, I think um, Amy hit it right on the head, which is I think there's a false dichotomy that algorithms can solve problems. Well, what can algorithms do? They can help solve prediction problems. But let's remember, there are many things that go into just broadly decisions, which is, is it fair? Is it equitable? Is it inclusive? So the way I view things is that it's when I like I spent five years doing some work for the Philadelphia Eagles. And one of the way and the way I always viewed the work that I did was when Mr. Lurie or Howie Roseman was making a decision, I wanted them to look at the computer screen and say, here's what the model says and use it as a decision support tool in but it's a multi-attribute objective function. I can give models that have great predictions, 
But what does it mean for the organization more broadly? What does it mean for fairness? What does it mean for the risk of the organization? So I'm all in on algorithms and I'm all in on using them as a decision support tool to support judgment. Thank you for that plug about Wharton's excellence approach to developing future leaders through decision-making with incomplete information. Uh, Amy, I want to stick with you for a little bit on, on the next couple of questions. With more and more states legalizing sports betting, how does analytics inform FanDuel's approach to onboarding or launching your services in a new, in a new location? Yeah, well, we just launched, um, funny enough, for those of you who are from the state of Ohio, on New Year's Eve, as the ball was dropping in Times Square, we literally just launched our 17th state. The regulator decided that New York New Year's Eve was a fantastic time to go live. <laughs> um, I, listen, there's uh, without analytics, there's no way we would get new, new state launches, right? I always talk about new state launches as something that impacts literally every single part of our organization. Um, and I'll highlight it. There's there's a few areas that that we rely heavily on as you think about a, a new state coming online. One is every state has nuances, right? So not all states are obviously created equal in terms of how attractive they are. But we're we're really trying to understand, you know, what is that? What are the demographics? What is the team fandom? In some states, for instance, they're bigger college sports than they are professional sports. Obviously, the demographics look very different. So the first is. Do I really understand who my sports betting user is in that state? Um, you know, that, that's the, the first thing. Um, second is we'll look at previous launches, right? Um, we learn a lot from what worked and what didn't work, and we're analyzing the data. We're looking at what was our initial promotional offer, our generosity strategy, if you will, in a new state. In some cases, we get it right. In some cases, you know, we, we may have left real value on the table. One of the things that's really important to keep in mind is, um, there is absolutely a first mover advantage when you talk about sports betting, right? We are not dissimilar to other large e-commerce industries where in the end, you're going to have a, a few scale players, right? Just given the nature of this business and how much it takes to invest in marketing and generosity and distinctive products. So being in market on day one and making sure that you're getting acquiring the right customers is absolutely critical. And so we're using data in science around which DMA should we be going after? How much should we be investing? We're looking at the acquisition cost relative to the player value or lifetime value of a customer to make sure that our paybacks are you know, within the right range. So all of that feeds our, our models to figure out how much we should be spending and, and where we should be spending. But then is also, you know, once you're in market or even leading up to it, you're looking at data to understand, like, I'll give you a good example. With Ohio that just came online, Michigan had been legal. And so there were some customers that were betting legally in Michigan and they thought they needed a different account in Ohio. And you don't, you just, you couldn't bet legally in Ohio until it was legalized. And so we could kind of look at some of the behavioral patterns and actually fix the friction before it a problem. So I could talk all day about how we use data in new state launches, but it, it has been a critical part of how we've gotten this right. And Ohio is a great example. I mean, our we call them our adoption curves, but our adoption curves um, just keep getting steeper and steeper. So within eight days, we had penetrated over 4% of the adult population with FanDuel alone. And, you know, years ago, if you looked at New Jersey, which was the first state, it wouldn't have been even close to that. So um, if you like data, you're intellectually curious, this is a really fun industry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I want to, since we're talking about where FanDuel is located, I want to ask a question about your physical location. So considering that you do have physical structures, physical places uh, for FanDuel, how do brick and mortar sites play into your overall strategy, given that your platform is essentially digitally based? Yeah, brick and mortar has actually been a very important part of our strategy. In fact, if you rewind the clock to 2018, when um, when the Supreme Court repealed what used to be a federal ban on online sports betting, one of our first physical presences was in the, the Meadowlands. For those of you who have been to the Meadowlands, there's a, a huge FanDuel branded sports book. And that actually gave us a head start in that market, right? Because we had brand awareness. Um, many of the consumers were comfortable with the betting product. And so when we came online, it really helped fuel our, our online business. Um, today, if I'm, we're sitting here, we probably have, we have about 27 now that Ohio just went live. So we have 27 different 
physical um, brand, FanDuel branded sports books. Some we may have multiple within a state. And part of it is our, you know, to um, for those of you who aren't as familiar with the 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 business, you have to have a license in order to operate. So any startup couldn't just decide, hey, I want to be a sports betting operator and I'm going to launch something in the state of New Jersey. You have to have a license or a skin. We do those through typically through um, what we call market access partners, and many of them are brick and mortar casinos. So Boyd, for instance, is one of our our big partners. But you know, retail has been a big part of the strategy, right? And understanding that omni-channel customer. We know they're more valuable if they're at our, both our retail location and online. Great, thank you. So, Eric, I actually want to move to you now. Um, how big of an equalizing role can sports analytics play in leveling the proverbial playing field? So, for example, can it allow teams to overcome advantages like better coaching, scouting, or team building? Yeah, it, it's an interesting question because I, I'm going to answer your question in a second, but I want to answer the first part, which is I think better coaches, scouts, and teams use analytics. So I don't see it. As a matter of fact, the way I evaluate good teams, coaches, and scouts is whether they're actually using data to make decisions on the field. And so that's one of the first things. So I think better coaches use data better. The second thing I would say is I, I've thought about this issue a lot. And, you know, I'm what they call in life an effect size person. And what I mean by that is, like, how big an effect is analytics? Like, would I rather have Bill Belichick as my coach as opposed to an average coach? Or would I rather have better data science? I've thought about this issue a lot. So I have two thoughts. First, um, while back in the you know, early 2000s when I started working with the Eagles, we were one of the first NFL franchises to have a data science group. Everyone has a data science group today. So first, I would say the differential advantage that you can get to catch up by data science is probably shrinking to some degree. But the advantage is always, and it's what we teach our students at Wharton, it's about asking the right questions. Lots of people can build algorithms, but they're not asking the right questions. The second thing I would say is you, if you force me to answer, I'm going to be honest. No, I'd rather have a better coach, a better team organization. I think if you're asking me, do are there winning franchises because of the way the owner, the general manager, the coach, etc., that analytics can't overcome that? Yes, I think analytics has a role. I'll take the better organization, the better coach, the better scouts every time. You know, it's funny that you say that because we oftentimes use this phrase data driven. And I've always taken exception to that to that phrase because it assumes that data is always correct and whatever the data say is what you should do. And it leaves out the role of judgment. It leaves out the role of personnel information. It leaves out history. It leaves out culture. It leaves out all of these other things that aren't a part of an algorithm. So what I hear you saying is uh, better to be data informed and still leverage the expertise and the culture and the relationships and the history that only comes from the coach. Yeah, I, I couldn't say it better. Let me, again, um, I, I used to describe it at parties to people and they said, so what did you do for the Eagles? And I said, here, let me describe to you in one word, in one sentence. Um, when Eagles have five minutes on the clock to make a draft pick and a scout, she or he, uses their judgment and says, Mr. Lurie, Mr. Roseman, we should pick this player. I want them to be able to look on their screen and say, this is what Bradlow's algorithm says the success of that player will be. And then to go back to the person and say, I want you to know the data says something different. You have 30 seconds to tell me why the data is saying one thing and your professional judgment is saying something else. And that's what good managers do. We can't ignore data. We can't ignore algorithms. We can't ignore the predictions. But they are data and information and support tools to help the expert make those decisions. And that's why we're all screaming at our televisions all the time at the coaches. Like, doesn't like I'm Googling at the same time a game's going on. Like, should they go for it fourth and two from their own 37? And there's a very simple chart that's up there that I'm sure Amy and FanDuel, they all everybody's got these <laughs> charts. Like, is it like they don't have the internet or 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 they observe something on the field. This is this is what you're mentioning. The coach will say after the game, whoever the coach is, she or he, I observed something on the field that wasn't in the model. 
I observe momentum. I observe this factor. And that's not in the model. Therefore, that's why I chose not to do it. It's hard to argue with that, but at least present the person with that statistical information. They can choose to ignore it if they want. Yeah, let me, I mean, let me comment on this from a, a managerial perspective as somebody who runs a, a company every day. I couldn't agree more, with Eric, with what you're saying. And at the end of the day, I, I spent 15 years at McKinsey. So trust me, I love data and analytics. Um, and, you know, my, my bias is always to start with the data. But ultimately, in, in almost every single decision that we make as executives, there's in some cases as much judgment that factors into it. And also, don't forget, right, these are not always isolated decisions you're making as executives. We're making trade-offs every single day around how we allocate resources. So something in absolute terms may look interesting. If you're trading it off against, you know, other priorities and other investment opportunities, it may actually lead you down a different path. So I, I think it's important to contextualize the how you're using the data and what decision you're making. Maybe also just to build on one thing that Amy just said, one thing that, you know, stat assistants, we don't really have jokes, but we have sayings, which is um, anybody can give you a point prediction. Anybody can give you a prediction. You hire stat assistants to understand risk and uncertainty. So what you happen, you see from models a lot is people say, this is the optimal thing to do but they don't take the risk into account. And this is what I talk to our students at Wharton about all the time. This decision adds extra points or increases the win probability. Yeah, but it also increases the variance by two or three X. And is that worth doing? And as Amy was speaking, I was thinking about the same types of decisions in business. I'm sure there are many, I'll call it myopic, short-term profit maximizing decisions that FanDuel could make. And if the models were perfect and if the world worked perfectly, every one of those decisions would be right. But we live in an uncertain world with high amounts of risk. And so we don't have to think just about the predictive models and how good their predictions are, but how uncertain are those predictions? Really important for everybody to understand. Yeah, it's a great point. So I just want to do a quick timeout for our audience and let them know, or remind them that we're going to be coming to your questions very shortly. So if you haven't had a chance yet, please use the chat function or the comment box and submit your questions. Uh, so Eric, back to you. As we saw with the recent life-threatening injury of DeMar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills, and Amy, we know you're a big Buffalo Bills fan. The I'm a big Buffalo Bills fan. <laughs> <laughs> the Bills, the Bills the Mafia, as they say. <laughs> I, have a, uh, I always say I had a, a big Buffalo Bills jersey in my office. Uh, but anyways, I grew up there. So, yes, I'm a big Bills fan. <laughs> well, we're going to give you a chance to chime in on this question also. But in thinking about, you know, the, the recent drama that happened and the publicity around the Bills with Damar Hamlin, the safety of sports and protection of its athletes remains an important issue to solve. So, Eric, are there ways analytics and big data can be leveraged to increase the safety of, a of athletes? Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways to do it. So first, um, one of the things that I'm very proud of that we started at Wharton about five or six years ago, as you know very well, Eric, is we have a, sentence, uh, a center under analytics at Wharton called the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative, which means we can actually measure brain data at a pretty granular level. We can actually, you know, I'm a big fan of actually measuring athletes' brain function over time. And I think one of the things we can do, like the DeMar Hamlin situation, which was just horrific for all of us to watch, was when will he ever be ready to go back on the field? And so analytics has a lot to say about that. The other things we've had, again, we've had guests on Wharton Moneyball that said, you can tell just by the motion, by the way someone's running their body language, their maximum speed, by video capture data using artificial intelligence, at least the claims are that health of an individual can be predicted by using artificial intelligence and big data science. So I'm hoping what we see in the future is that while athletes are on the field, men and women, that actually, if you'd like, some real-time scoring can be happening behind the scenes. There's an 83% chance Eric Bradlow has a hamstring injury on his right lower leg. Um, maybe we should take him out of the game because he's not performing optimally and the way he's running is suggesting some form of injury. Um, I think data science is, while there are privacy issues, there's no doubt about it, I think it's going to help player safety going forward, and I think it's an area that we should heavily invest in. 
Amy, anything you would add to this discussion on player safety? No, I think Eric nailed it. I mean, listen, is is somebody who's interesting because I was glued to the television um, when that Damar Hamlin situation happened. As an aside, I actually thought ESPN did a phenomenal job covering a very difficult situation. But I actually think I think what you said is fascinating. It's part of it that we don't look at that side of it as much. But to think that you can use data and science to um, for player health is is pretty remarkable. Um, so I, th- your, I think your comments were were well said. Uh, Eric, analytics doesn't just affect affect sports between the lines. Has a similar amount of analytics progress been made on the business side side of sports? Yeah, I mean, I think Amy summarized it when she talked about her experience at Ticketmaster. But let's just talk about the business side briefly. And what's interesting is um, I almost think that the sports side infected the business side. And what I mean by that is that once people start to realize, hey, wait a second, we can use granular data to make decisions on plays. We can use granular decisions to make decisions on who to you know, what contract to sign someone to. Maybe we can do things like dynamic t- ticket pricing. Amy mentioned as well, I thought it was great, uh, CRM systems, cross-selling, what what deals to give players, et cetera, um, player contracts, cap space, et cetera. So I actually think that the business side of sports, it's why our, our center, Wasabi, is the Wharton Sports Analytics Business Initiative, is that I don't know how you do the business of sports anymore without the analytics of sports. In other words, analytics affects ticket buying situations, ticket pricing, sponsorship value, um, as Amy mentioned, tracking the ability to track customers over time and understand their customer lifetime value. That part is absolutely crucial. So to me, I think we've kind of, I think the sports field side, the Wharton Moneyball side, if you'd like, has infected the business side in a good and positive way. And Eric, it's interesting because I think the um, not I think, I know, the leagues are starting to play a much more powerful role in helping their teams get access to the data. So if you think about what digital ticketing unlocked, the NFL, I think, has done a phenomenal job here. What they've done is they have created an integrated platform whereby they can pull together all the ticketing data, F&B, merch, right? Think about all the data that you can integrate into one ecosystem and to be able to look at that and analyze that in a consistent way across 32 different NFL club teams is pretty remarkable. Um, And there are companies out there. There's a wonderful company called Kager Craft Analytics Group, which is one run by a woman named Jessica Gelman. And they specialize in helping leagues and teams that, that harness the power of that data. And all that's possible, right, because technology is changing and the power of being able to, to pull all that data, and but visualize it and use it in a consumable um, and democratized way. It's really powerful now. So, Amy, I'm going to give you the last word before we turn over to questions from the audience. Looking ahead five years, how will analytics continue to evolve and advance your industry? Oh, gosh, it's such a great question. Um, Listen, I think the if you think about I'll I'll talk about this from, you know, why FanDuel has been so successful in the U.S. Right. And right now we have anywhere between a low 40 to, you know, low 50 percent share of the online sports betting market. Um, and it's really data is the reason that we have it is really one of the primary reasons we've been successful. And I think there's two areas that we have to continue to to strengthen and protect. One is I've talked a bit about the product, right? Our risk and trading organization every day. They're innovating. They're think about the risk and trading organization is the the group that is coming up with our assortment. So figuring out how do we continue to innovate, use the data and bring new products to market that are elevating the sports betting experience, Um, but marketing, right? At at the end of the day, we are spending between marketing and generosity alone, you're spending close to $2 billion. And so every basis point improvement in how you spend that is massive value creation, especially in a tech sector where there's a lot of focus on path to profitability. Um, But I also think you're going to see changing experiences, right? Is in some of these things are still unknown. Will the metaverse have a, a material impact on user experiences and how consumers, um, you know, engage in sports betting. And so I think there's there's a lot of things that I'm 
quite certain and we have a, a pretty clear path for for how we continue to innovate and take the industry and then i think there's a there's a lot of uncertainty around emerging technologies and new betting platforms and i think for those technologies you've got to really focus on learning and evolving and understanding how they're going to play out so that you're at least in the game when these things potentially either take off or they don't so thank you for that so it looks like we have had a number of questions come in from our viewers. Um, here's a question for both of you. What can businesses in other sectors learn from approaches used in sports analytics? And as importantly, what can sports analytics learn from how analysis is done and used in from other industries? Eric, you want to take that one first? Well, the, the first thing I would say that is- That sounds like I a good professorial question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I entered it. I figured I would ask a question of myself. And I, could <laughs> I, I, I would st I would start with saying that um, I think what sports has done extraordinarily well is really it is really about the data. And it's the form of integrated data that Amy talked about, which is, I think, you know, what I always say for every company is that here's the holy trinity of data you wish you had for every company. You wish you had data on people's transaction or performance. Of course, just measuring transaction is not enough because maybe from that you can compute someone's customer lifetime value or how much that customer's worth, or you can do a projection of that but you don't know who the customer is. So wouldn't it be great to have that tied to some demographics or knowledge about the customer? And then the third part, which is what Amy talked about a lot as well, is having that tied to CRM data, because I'll, I'll say this in a facetious way, Amy's job as the CEO of FanDuel is not to measure customer value, it's to maximize customer enjoyment and value. So to do that, you need marketing data tied to transactional data. And so I think every company can learn from what I call the holy trinity, the big three of data, which is having transactional data is great, having performance data is great, but tying that to who is the customer so you really understand the customer and then tying it to whether it's discounts, emails, et cetera, that allows you then to optimize against it. And so I think every company can learn that from the sports field that's starting to put that data together. And I think what sports can learn from other fields, I think it's just there, there is no area of the business that shouldn't be touched by analytics. I think every area of business should be empirically supported by predictive models. I completely, completely agree with that. And listen, I, you know, we actually look to many other industries um, as analogs, right? We look at financial services. I think there's some of the companies that are outstanding at, you know, there's, there's not just seven or 10 segments. There's almost an infinite number of segments as you think about how you really go after customers and personalize the experience. Um, payments is such a critical part of what we do. And so getting that, the payment solution and that experience, right, is really critical. And there's some other industries, but even, you know, I mean, uh, maybe everyone's a little bit sick of hearing about Amazon, but at the end of the day, what they do very well is they take friction out of the experience. And so we're looking at many other companies to say, how do you remove friction? Because ultimately, at the, at the end of the day, consumers want a simple and easy betting platform. They want to be able to deposit and withdraw their winnings, you know, very quickly, easily. And so figuring out where and how you can take friction out of the process and where those things ultimately are a game changer for both acquisition and loyalty is, is, is a huge unlock. And we use data every day. I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about is the importance of um, our test and control pl platform, right? Every day we're, we're doing tests to figure out what features should we launch and, you know, what's working and what's not working, where are customers getting stuck in the process, if you will. So the, the test and control piece of that, which is obviously all fueled by data and analytics, is a really critical part of how you optimize the customer experience over time. Yeah. So, Amy, while, while you have the floor, you referenced Amazon as an organization, a business that has really leveraged data in, in meaningful and impactful ways. Are there other examples of businesses or industries that have been transformed by analytic approaches? And, Amy, we'll start with you, and then, Eric, I wonder, as, as you are in the classroom talking about analytics and its use from other companies, if you have examples as well. Well, I mean, listen, I think there, 
there are a few industries out there that either haven't been or ultimately won't be disrupted by technology and data, right? I mean, if you think about, you know, look at look at a lot of the industries where, you know, I talked about the importance of scale advantage and ultimately two or three big players will, will emerge as leaders. If you look at, you know, online travel, if you look at food delivery, if you look at ride share, at the end of the day, it was the, the use of superior technology, data and analytics that drove really two companies, right? Typically two companies in each of those sectors drive 60 to 70% of the share and value creation. Um, and, and, I, and we believe it's going to be the same. If you look at sports betting right now, you have close to 60 different online sports betting operators. Ultimately, we don't think there are going to be more than two or three scale players. You're going to have, you might have some niche players and all of that's going to come down to better use of technology, data and analytics. Thanks. Eric, do you have thoughts on other examples of businesses or industries that have really been transformative in the analytics space? Yeah, the one that I, I would suggest, which whenever I give a lecture on analytics, I love giving examples of industries that have been transformed and ones that surprise people. And it's actually in-store retailing. I think in-store retailing has done a tremendous job of using analytics. Um, I've worked on projects where we've tracked individuals through stores through GPS tracking. Obviously, facial re recognition software. Unfortunately, there's good and bad that comes with that type of software, both from a fairness, equity, inclusion type of perspective. But there is the ability to track and recognize individuals as they're through stores. Um, Amy talked about I'm so glad you talked about the same because I would have regretted if we didn't talk about the idea of experimentation and test control. Um, brick and mortar stores are now able to do much better experimentation that we always used to think of only for online platforms that was easy to do experimentation. So, you know, one of the centers, as you know well, Erica, that we have here, thanks to Jay Baker and his family, is the Baker Retailing Initiative. I think the things that I see the most exciting in the retail industry today are the use of analytics and, if you'd like, modern technology to transform the retail, the brick and mortar retailing industry. And at the end of the day, it has to do with the consolidation that Amy talked about. If they don't learn how to use big data and technology to improve their business, most of the business will get consolidated to online. They have to be able to fight back to online retailing to get the same kind of rich data that you typically think of only clickstream data giving you, but now you can get it in the store. As a matter of fact, that's what has me most excited about my own research over the next 20 years or so. How can brick and mortar retailers, not that I don't like online, and I am a fan dual customer, as I told Amy off air, <laughs> but I'm equally excited. I'm equally... <laughs> Um, I won't say whether I'm positive or negative on FanDuel on air, but let me just say, <laughs> but either way, um, I'm very excited about helping support brick and mortar retailers and get the kind of data they need so they can do the same type of analytics as e-tailers. Great. So we have a question that's come in for both of you. Um, how do we account for variables that are not captured by the data and the algorithms? Eric, you want to start with that one as given your scholarly background? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, obviously every model has observable factors and unobservable factors. Um, what, I, what I would say, I'll give you this scholarly answer. Um, let's imagine FanDuel or any company comes up with a predictive model. And let's imagine after the fact, you recognize that there's some systematic form of inaccuracies in that model. That actually is what leads in the academic world to uh, model improvement. In other words, oh, I see what's happening. When games are played in domes, we didn't take that factor into account. And therefore, the spread that we're actually producing is not equalizing the two teams in an appropriate way. One can actually, uh, matter of fact, one of the biggest part of using statistical models is model evaluation, model improvement, and out of sample predictive accuracy. So the way I would say is what's unobserved and unaccounted for today is what our job is as researchers, is to find out where models are limited, to try to posit ways, measurable variables that we can use to proxy or to improve those models. And But no, in some sense, it's a tautological question. Um, if something is purely unobserved and never observable, but is driving behavior, 
Um, that's the kind of thing that's just, if you'd like, we call that unobservable or unexplainable variation. And every process has that. Yeah, I mean, uh, we alluded to some of it a little bit earlier in sports betting, but you know, if there's there's really two. If you if, the, if you really simplify it, there's hard data that goes into building these statistical models. And, and as I mentioned, you know, we've kind of we've really refined this over the course of decades to know which signals matter most when you're setting the line and determining odds and and in determining what your pricing is. We do all of that in-house. Almost all of our betting markets are done in-house as opposed to by a third party, which allows us to actually be much more accurate. But at the end of the day, as I also said, there's there's you know a fair bit of judgment that oftentimes gets overlaid on top of those models by the risk and trading organization. You know, whether a player gets hurt at the last minute, there could be any number of factors that might move the line. Um, and so there, you know, it's not just a, hey, the model spits out an answer and that's the price. There's, there's again, there's quite a, a fair bit of judgment on top of that. And, you know, part of it is there's also luck that's involved, right? Which is why it's so fun. I mean, an, a big element of what we do is even though statistically, and I will say the, the, the risk and trading organization, they're, they're remarkable in terms of their accuracy when they're setting the lines and determining what the point spread should be. But when you're talking about things like parlays and same game parlays, right? Especially they're you know they're betters who would have a 15 leg parlay. Statistically, when you layer that many parlays on top of each or bets on top of each other, the odds of it hitting become very low. But they hit right, and that's the fun or the the luck element of it that that makes sports betting so fun. So um, it's not quite as black and white as as you might think from the outside. It's also, of course, Amy, the psychology of sports betting, which is people like tend to like big payouts, even though those have low probability events. And so, you know, that's just standard psychology that um, people overinflate small odds. People don't think about expected payout as much. And that's also what I mentioned earlier, which is even though there's a lot of risk in these multi-leg parlay bets, when they do hit, you know, I'll call it happiness is not linear in money. So a lot of money makes me really happy and winning a small to medium sized bet makes me happy. But if I just win that one five leg parlay on FanDuel, I'm happy yeah. for a lifetime. And I have a story to tell all my friends for a lifetime. Well, and it's funny you say that because I was, you know, I was looking at some of our data the other day and part of it too is tied to the narrative that people want, right? I mean, people love high scoring games because they're exciting. 75% of the money tends to go on the over, right? Because consumers expect and they want to, to see their favorite players and quarterbacks do well in, in a high scoring game. So it, it's, uh, they're, they're, you're right, there's a lot of psychology that, at the end of the day too. As a psychologist, I'm loving this conversation. <laughs> I'm sort of analyzing my own behavior. <laughs> um, so Amy, are sports betting odds adjusted in real time based on tracking or biometric player data or are odds reliant on data from previous competitions? What's Both. the secret sauce there? Both. Both. Yeah, I mean, without without giving away more than I should. <laughs> um, I mean, the honest answer is you're you're taking in history. I mean, there's so you, you, if you separate between there's you know there's pregame bets and then there's live betting, right? So different data uh -huh. is obviously feeding um, different betting markets. But with the with the rise of live betting, right? We just launched a product this year called um, it's a live same game parlay product, and so you're you know you're taking in data feeds, um, oftentimes for the live betting throughout the course of the game. So it, it becomes, uh, and also we're trying to get that data where where we can, right? The the real unlock is when you're able to integrate the sports betting experience with the actual with the live broadcast of the live event. So the ability to get that data to a Charles Barkley who might be broadcasting the event for you is, is part of the unlock as well. Um, so I can't, I won't say more than that in terms of exactly what data we're taking for, for different types of bets, but there's, um, but that, that because um, live betting and, you know, the parlay, the player props have become such a big part of it, the need to have the right data signals at the right time, right? Real-time data feeds becomes even more important. 
Well, let me actually just tie your answer, Amy, to a question that Erica asked earlier, which is what other fields can learn from sports. Let's imagine through motion tracking data and artificial intelligence, which can be done in large scale in a somewhat automated fashion. You know, let's imagine you can't have scouts or humans watching every sporting event at every time, but cameras can be watching every sporting event at every time. So let's imagine a world where all of that video data is being processed in large scale and being fed into whether it's fan duel or whatever other engine. It's the same thing. Imagine I'm Walmart and I've got 10,000 stores and I had motion tracking data of people walking around the stores, which products are they looking at, etc. Imagine I had that data in real time and I could decide what product to put on the end cap, what dynamic prices to charge bet, better, uh, based on motion tracking data. FanDuel wants the answer to that question no more than Walmart wants the answer to that question. So to me, this idea of live betting or live kind of data updates, I think that's where artificial intelligence and machine learning come in because we can do this at scale and in real time. Well, we're almost uh, out, of time, out of time. So I want to ask one or two more questions. One of our viewers is asking if the gut instinct is still valuable or if we're so, should be so dependent on analytics. Uh, as an analytics scholar, building a model may call this the heuristics of experience. What What are your thoughts on whether gut instinct still matters? Oh, I think it's a great question. Um, the The answer to me is yes, but it also depends on. I think it depends on the decision, and it depends on your experience base. Um, you know, I think it's it's very interesting because I, you know, I separate Bezos talks about one way, one way doors and two way doors, right? When you're making decisions, um, one way door, meaning it's hard to come back. If you get the answer wrong, two way doors is you, you can kind of make, you can, you can rely on judgment a little bit more. So I think sometimes the use of gut or judgment depends a little bit on what the decision is. What I would say though, is, you know, I, I just turned 50 last year and now I have a lot of pattern recognition around different types of problems. And so sometimes, you know, maybe early on in my career, I might have had to analyze the death out of something before I felt comfortable making a decision. Now, because I have so much pattern recognition, I've seen so many different types of problems. Um, it does two things for you. One is you can get to the hypothesis much more quickly and validate whether that's the right answer. But two, sometimes you actually don't even need the data to make a decision because you've just seen enough and you know you actually, in some cases, you actually just need to move quickly. I think that was actually a function in, in during COVID. There were some cases where it was like we don't have the we don't have the luxury of time to sit there and analyze the data. I was a ticket master at the time. We had fifty four thousand events on the platform, and the only thing customers cared about was how they were going to get their refunds back. And so, there's moments where you actually you kind of got to go, and you you have to rely on your gut. But it's a it's a bit nuanced. Yeah, yeah. Eric, any any last comment on that question? Yeah, first, Amy, welcome to the 50 Club is the first thing I'd say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I've been there for a while. The second thing I would say is I liked your previous answer also to a different question, which was, why wouldn't you want to know the answer from the normative predictive model? That's a great baseline. In other words, statistics don't lie data don't lie. So me, I use gut intuition all the time in forecasting outcome of games. But the first thing I want to know is what does the betting line say? What do the predictive models say? Start from there. And you can always deviate from there based on, this relates to Erica's earlier question, information that I may have that the model might not have or information it hasn't captured. But and maybe this is my training as a statistician and economist. I don't know why you wouldn't use the empirical data odds as a baseline to start with. Gut intuition can always move you from there. Excellent. All right, down to the last question. This is a quick one. What advice would each of you give to someone interested in breaking into the sports analytics arena? Amy? Um, a couple of things. One is uh, invest in the, you know, the your, for those of you who are still at school, invest in, in actually getting up to speed. There, you know, Eric apparently is one of the world-renowned professors here, but um, take the courses that this is actually the time where you can build the hard skills. Once you move into a company, it can be a little bit harder to do that. So, um, so, so take the time to do that. But uh, the other thing I would say is 
you know, be open to different types of opportunities. Sometimes when you're coming out of undergrad or business school, you have a very specific thing of what you want to do, in, in, at least in my career. Over time, I've gotten exposure to a lot of different types of problems, partly because of consulting, but partly because I was open to to learning different things. And so it's great if you know exactly what you want to do, but if you don't you know, force yourself to get exposure to a lot of different types of things, I think you actually grow um, in some ways faster than you do if you're just focused on one specific thing. Eric? And I guess my, my 15 second answer would be um, make sure, as Amy said, you tool up on R, SQL, Python, all the tools that you need to actually build predictive models. But at the end of the day, it comes down to asking the right questions. And that's, to be honest with you, why I feel have been fortunate to have been at Wharton for 27 years now. We not only have the brightest students in the world, but hopefully what we're training them is not just the technical skills, but the right business questions to ask. And it's always, success is always going to come down to that. Are you asking the right questions and then using the appropriate models to answer them? Excellent. Well, on that note, we're going to close things out. Thank you, Amy and Eric. And thank you to our audience for participating in today's Beyond Business conversation. This concludes this year's Beyond Business Lecture Series. You can view any of our previous episodes under events on Wharton's LinkedIn page and our YouTube channel. So until next year, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of all of what 2023 will, will bring. We'll see you around for the next series of Beyond Business.